Hey, movie lovers, welcome back for another Anatomy of Movie here at the Popcorn Talk Network. Today, we're talking about The Hate You Give. That's right. What a powerful movie, and we're going to dissect all of it. Stay tuned. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk. We talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's Anatomy of a Movie. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Marissa Serafini is Hello, here. Hello, everyone. I'm Phil Svitek. Missing in action today is Dimitri Panos. He's on a business trip, so he could not join us. We are listening to the sounds of Tupac, which permeate throughout this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it. Speaking of which, allow me to welcome you to the show. For those of you who this is your first episode, a couple of things to note. Number one. We assume that you've seen the movie, so we're going to talk about it from that perspective. Ergo, it's going to be spoiler-filled, so this has been your warning. Furthermore, we don't just review the movie. Yes, we'll talk storylines and plot points and give our opinions on things. However, we'll also talk about the larger context of things as far as the making of, the box office, the reception, and all that. And in this case, the sort of political implications, because if you're unaware, it's a very political movie. So we'll talk about that, and we encourage you to also, in the description box, there's a PDF link that has all of our research, so you can check out some of the things that perhaps we don't get to in our discussion of it, but it helps fully fully round out the movie, hopefully. Uh, and of course, you're encouraged to comment along, uh, whether you know, you're right here live with us, or in the future, or our future, rather, your present. <laughs> Because at the end of the day, that's what makes movies so great. We can talk about them, and you know, we start a conversation, but that doesn't mean it's over. Um, in particular, a movie like this, I think, merits a lot of conversation. So, in fact, that's where I'll open things up. Marissa, what was your overall impression of the movie, The Hate You Give? I thought, wow. Okay, because originally I went into this film really not knowing what it was going to be about. I think I saw the trailer maybe only once, months ago. Um, so I, I went in not really knowing what to expect, and I, I, I got a lot of great performances out of the actors. Um, the content is very heavy, and it's very politically and just socially uh, a topic that is, is hard to talk about, and I liked how they addressed it, and they did it in a good job, and we'll get more into it. So um, I, I think they did a good job in the execution of that and just getting... The, you know, the conversation started in that sense. And opening it up to how it affects so many different demographics and generations. Just so you know you don't have to be just African American to understand and relate this story. Um, so I like the universal themes that came out of this movie. It's heavy. It's a heavy film. Don't watch it in the morning. It'll ruin your day. Don't watch it at night. It'll ruin your night. So it's... <laughs> I warn if you... I mean, you... If you're listening to us, you have seen it, hopefully. But it is a heavy movie, and I wasn't expecting that. But where I will give it a lot of credit, it's... And, you know, the song we opened up with from Tupac is a more hopeful song, right? And this movie, as dark as it is, at the end, they offers a, a very inspiring message, at least by my calculation, right? Um, I'm, I'm very moved by it. I think a lot of the... It gets... It gets really dark before, it, it, it's like that saying, it's darkest before the dawn. It yeah. gets really dark before there's any hope. But when the hope finally comes at the end, it, it's earned, it's felt, and I, I loved it. And it's not to detract from movies like Sorry to Bother You or Black Klansman that, that deal somewhat similar issues. I think those are very powerful movies in their own right. And they're allowed to have their own perspective, but they're, they're a little bit more grim. And you're kind of left with, well, now what? What do I do? Where's this? Gives you a sense of optimism. And it's not saying the world's perfect, but it's also saying that, yeah, we've got work to do, but it can be done. Mm -hmm. And that's what I took most out of the movie. Um, And, yeah, it was definitely tough to watch. Um, I mean, so let's kind of, let's break it down, at least in this sense, uh, to kind of intro things, right? You have the main character, um, and basically... Star. Star. And she's... Uh, n- no coincidence. Her name has so many different meanings. 
very deliberately, right? She's like the star witness and mm-hmm. all this, all this stuff, right? But essentially, she, the whole act, the whole movie is about her making a certain choice, and the way it works is. From all around her, there's people with very strong beliefs about what she should do. And they're pulling her in that direction. And for the, what makes this movie uh, very smart for me, and I'd love to hear more from you, is this idea that everyone can justify their viewpoint. And so you buy into it. It's not, and that's what makes it very conflicting is because you're like, well, I understand this perspective. I understand that perspective. I understand this. And so which, who's right? Mm-hmm. And um, by the end, I think she chooses something that um, that satisfies all point that uh, that satisfies all viewpoints that I was not expecting. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because she is the main character that sees both sides, literally, of the story. They from the from the Black African American community to the Caucasian community for the school that she goes to. So, and the audience is following her. So we real time see what she's witnessing from both opinions and perspectives. And I think that's interesting to see because it really depends on uh, whatever type of person you are while watching this film. Like what side do you agree on or what opinions do you agree on? And I think they they showed that very well because it does, it isn't all black and white. It is that gray middle and it's hard to uh, like really... Not not to say choose a side, but um, understand where everyone is coming from in their perspective. And I think they did a good job of showing that it is confusing. Um, and But it's also frustrating at the same time because she is the, the main witness. And you know, as a general person, you're like, you want to root for her to do the right thing. But she is conflicted in the position that she's in. She's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Well, she's conflicted because she doesn't know what the right thing is. She knows she needs she knows she needs to stand up and be the voice um, for him, but at the same time, the what what happened was the the at the end of the day, the movie opens up with the talk, the idea that listen, it's not right that the police are doing this, but essentially uh, live to fight another day, and in the case of Khalil. He was not listening to her, and that led to his his death. So he himself, but so you can call him a victim of circumstance as far as why he got into the drug dealing and so forth. Um, and that's where she's conflicted because she's like, listen, he's not fully innocent, but it's not right that a cop gets to do this. Mm-hmm. And so what is get that? Away with it. <laughs> yeah. So what is that? What is that truth? What is the right thing, in fact, to do? Um, and for me, her arc really is this uh, this idea that whether she knows something or not, she's at least talking about it. And I think that's, if you, there's anything you walk away with, it's just the more we talk and the more, and the other side of it, the more we listen, mm-hmm. the more we can come to some sort of conclusion. Yeah, and that's the good thing about this movie that I said earlier, that this movie does the job of just getting the conversation started. Um, it, it might not be all the opinions and perspectives that one wants to believe or, or, or talk about. It is taboo in a way, but it it needs to be said. It needs to be understood, and the only way you can understand it is when people talk about it, even though people don't want to. Yeah, and that to me was kind of the interesting part where she goes to her to to the school with the white kids, right? Uh, where she's star version two. And um, her friend, Sabrina Carpenter, um, Haley. Haley. Not, you know, by the end, she certainly wasn't a redeemable character. But very early on, some of the things that Haley was saying, I was like, okay, I, I, I'm not saying she's right. But you, as star, you're not, you're not educating her on why her opinions are wrong. Mm-hmm. You're just kind of baffled and being shocked. But you got. You know, it doesn't take away from what she's saying, but you gotta, you gotta say something. And um, and by the end, I'm glad she does. And unfortunately, Haley at this point in time is not ready to change. At least maybe she'll change one day, but right now she's just 
a little racist. Right, and and the problem with Haley is that she is young, and I know I'm not making like youth as an excuse, but she's young, misinformed, and naive just because she doesn't see the second the the other community that Star also sees. She only sees the white privileged Caucasian community, and it's it's frustrating in that sense that she's not educated in the world. <laughs> Um, and, and to have more opinions than just that one of her own and not see the bigger picture and all of that. And also, it, it does beg the question, like, why are they friends? And it, it applies to everybody in life. Like, were you only friends with the people in school because you were just stuck together in all the same classes? Does that make you friends just because you're in the same place? Um, and it clearly shows that they were together out of convenience they were hanging out together out of convenience, not out of, like, pure friendship. Yeah, and, the, you know, as far as her, right, she, Haley, it, the movie makes it very deliberate that she's been educated by the news, essentially. Like, what she sees, that's going to be her perspective, and that's what she's going to be reacting to. And one, one of the things that the movie tries to do is humanize, like, this story is a very universal story. How many times have we seen moments like this? But it all, all we really get to see it as it's just this news story and obviously a news story has a certain angle even when it's trying to be unbiased of course it's gonna just have an inherent bias one way or the other definitely gonna look biased and therein lies the problem like Haley, you could say for better or worse this is what she's grown up as seeing these types of things and so at the end of the day that's the only conclusion that she can draw upon um now again what's interesting is that Star also, up until that point, up until this crisis, uh, which is a, a literary term, I'm not, but at the end of the day, I guess it could be crisis for, for the actual thing. Mm -hmm. um, she put on a version of herself that's not true. So as far as their friendships, like Haley thought this was her true friend, but Star was putting on a lie of herself. It is really not. And then I also just feel bad for Haley and not in that way but it's just every time you see a Haley character you never see any family involvement of Haley's side you never see Haley's parents um, you only see Haley and her own one dimensional um, perspective compared to Star you see her whole family you see the parents influence on Star's mentality and her personality and her behavior um, so it, it's interesting that Haley doesn't she wasn't brought up the same way that Star was. Mm -hmm. um, and you just feel bad for Haley in the sense because she wasn't, um, she wasn't educated like her parents educated Star. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things, like, we, we've been talking about this duality of Star, right? She comes from her neighborhood, and she's very hesitant, like with Chris, the boyfriend, to bring him anywhere close to her neighborhood. Um, but... Her as an actress, uh, uh, these are quotes, right? She exhibits stereotypical mixed girl features. She she has a black mo black mother and a white father, and they cast her very deliberately so that way, as they say, white audiences could empathize a little bit easier, which, in a sense, is 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 kind of, I'll use the term fucked up to have to like this is what you have to rely on. Yeah, no. But it's also kind of brilliant that you are aware of that fact and that you put that in there and are able to create that connection with an audience. See, and I didn't think that at all because I didn't know the fact that Manla was, is, is mixed race going into the film. And I imagine, like, yeah, she, she's gotten bigger roles as of the last few years, but she's not a household name yet, and people don't know her personal history. So I think that's a very unfair fact to go off for casting just to appeal to the white Caucasian demographic. That sounds wrong. It, again, it, these are things that sound wrong, but I think like they pulled it off with a very deliberate notion in mind and uh, sort of cutting ahead. The fact that like it receives an A-plus on cinema score, it, I, I think it resonates with a lot of people. And uh, again, I, I don't think... If you're like a white audience, you're consciously aware of the fact that you... First off, for me, I don't... Re... Like on the surface, I shouldn't relate to her at all. Uh, she's a teenage girl. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, not something I easily would relate in that sense. But uh, despite all the surface level uh, differences that her and I might have, I very much empathized with her. 
And I think that's as far as the writing, the acting, the direction, the editing, and all all those things come together uh, to create that sentiment. Right. I relate in in that sense that because uh, I am, if you can't tell, I am Asian, but I grew up in a uh, predominantly white Caucasian uh, neighborhood. Um, and I come from a different town than everybody else did. So, like, I understood the community and acting a certain way because you're around certain people. So I related to that sense. It's like you don't feel like you're a true authentic self and you're around certain people. And so, and, like, I found that very relatable. But I, I the whole idea that you have to be mixed just to understand it, that's that's bad marketing. Well, I don't think, obviously, it's not like on the poster, like, hey, come see this. She's, right. <laughs> that's not I, it. I think I think they, they might have made that statement just to kind of justify the casting, which they shouldn't. They should justify it based on acting and talent. Yeah. I'm, I'm not entirely, yeah, here's the thing. I, I, I'm not reading deeper into their intention as far as, like, why, why they're justifying anything. Again, as far as her, yeah, up until I read that, I wouldn't have necessarily, I didn't think about it. Um, all I knew was that I thought she was, I believed her in the role, and I believed her actions, and uh, mm -hmm. to me, she was, in a, by the end, became larger than life, even though she was a teenage girl, you know. Yeah, she's a very likable character, um, and, th and that's good, because you definitely want to follow your main actress if you don't feel or empathize in some way. Yeah, and so, um, but as far as, like, the, Casting wise, I think they, they really nailed everyone tremendously and there's no one I can point to that is really a surface level character. Everyone is very fleshed out. Yes, they exhibit certain um, stereotypes at, at, at certain things, but, but they're, they're justified and you understand why. Um, and a lot of times the, the stereotypes get flipped on their head. You know, they're not mm -hmm. they're not what you think they are. Um, like even even her parents, the whole notion that they were supposed to not really last. Like that's that's what everyone's opinion of this relationship was, and the fact that he stuck around, the father, Maverick, you know, all this time is a is a breaking of a certain stereotype. Right. And I liked how they did show each family member definitely had their own individual flaws. Like the, the mother took back the father after he cheated. Um, the son, Seven, is not from the original father. You know, he's from a different family. And it's like I loved how each character did have their own moment to show this isn't a perfect family. No family is. But uh, it, it's about, it's not about like their flaws, it's about what you do when you overcome your your outward appearance to other people it's it's sticking together it's that family connection bond and i, I liked how they they show that because it it did bring that family more together and more relatable in that sense it's like yes they're not to say broken they're definitely flawed but they're still together and one cohesive family well the number one strength that they have is they they value each other's opinions and they let each other be heard uh, you know, towards the middle of the movie when Maverick is dealing with King and, and kind of doing it on his own, it's because him and him and Lisa stop really communicating, right? He's much more reactionary and I'm just going to do this. I don't need, I don't want to get your perspective. I'm not going to even tell you what I'm going to be doing. I'm just going to go do it. Whereas at the beginning and the end, the entire family is communicating. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, so at the end of the day, that's, that, that Again, whether someone makes a mistake or does something wrong or whatever, just talking it out, that's what keeps the bond going. Yeah. Because right. um, especially, like, one of the more evident moments of it is when she brought, brings Chris, her boyfriend, in after prom. Right. <laughs> you know, he's like, who is this guy? Yeah, the moment of levity, definitely, in, in the movie. And I like that because that is a very realistic um reveal that a father would have when he doesn't know his own daughter is having this relationship and i think a lot of men just in general can relate to who's this guy you're bringing home he he it, he went like papa bear in a sense yeah and like first off it's bad enough like as a father there is that typical like it doesn't matter who my daughter dates i'm gonna mm -hmm. 
yeah, I'm going to be the Papa Bear. And then when it's someone that you're not expecting at all, like a different, you know, you obviously you kind of have an idea of who your daughter should date. Um, and at first it's kind of very surface level. But then when it's she brings into home somebody else and the fact that she says to him, like, listen, you taught me to see a person for who they really are, essentially. And then he's like, OK, wow. I can't believe I've had that impact on your life. And that's the message you took away rather than he has to look like me physically. Right. And also that scene shows that Nav, in some sense, made snap judgments, too, about race. He, I mean, he saw a Caucasian guy and immediately tried to tip him, thinking he was the chauffeur or the, the escort. So it's like he made racial snap judgments as well. So he's not perfect either. And, mm. and not to say that he was racist but he definitely had those qualities as well yeah um for sure i thought um one of the performances that really captured me was uh regina hall i'm not sure about you but for me her as the mother uh, when, when we talk about strong female characters you know not only obviously star but but lisa herself mm -hmm. and you know star and lisa don't always align they, you can have two separate women still strong and respectful for each other that have differing opinions. And I thought I thought Regina Hall portrayed that fantastic. And uh, yeah, I thought Lisa was great because seeing the parents, you know, Lisa and Maverick together, they gave just the audience hope that this family has a a chance to survive and overcome all this and weather all the storm. And I, I liked her because, yes, she's flawed, but she also realizes the, the struggles, like taking back Mav after cheating, um, but always still be supportive because that's what good wives do. That's what good someone who's truly in love would do. They would find forgiveness and the theme of forgiveness and moving forward. But she also holds him to a high standard when her and um, uh, Common, who plays Carlos, when they're going at it, she says, like, this is ridiculous, like, stop, you know, and she's, she tells him, this is wrong, this is, you know, you guys shouldn't be doing this, so, um, she's not like a damsel in distress that just allows things to happen to her, she is able to affect them. Right, and I, I love the, the parents in this, um, in this movie, because it's, like Dalai Lama says, a strong foundation starts at the home, and having two strong parents gives these children, the next generation, hope that they can survive all this. Yeah, and I think that's it's a very well, maybe not as subtle as I, but it's it it's not fully hammered home as far as like didactically, but it's certainly prevalent there, um, and it's a good takeaway for any audience because um, mm -hmm. there's there's plenty of white neighborhoods with broken broken families and and whatnot. So um, having a having a strong family yeah it will allow you to be a strong human being yes um so i appreciate that um but since i brought up common carlos in the movie i do want to talk about him because it's interesting uh, it represents another that that side of things where he's a cop uh so he's got to you know do things quote unquote he, for the cops, right? He's like representing that side, but he's also a black man, so he's got to stand up for, for his own race, and he's kind of torn in the in the middle, and therefore, his family is tearing him away. Like it's interesting. Everyone has this duality that they're being pulled from, you know, one side and the other, and it's like which side is right, and that that's affecting Star. And I thought uh, the the moment where Star questioned Carlos about how would you act in that situation? Mm -hmm. And he answers differently just based on race. It was a very powerful moment. It's powerful and also frustrating because he, being in the position that he, it could, that he could have very well have been the police officer in that situation. And it's frustrating to see a grown man be put in that situa situation and know what he would do uh, because of, race and it's frustrating because he even said it himself it's not a perfect world he has to balance the two as well but it's frustrating because you know he can't do anything about it mm -hmm. yeah 100 like he sounds like a hypocrite 
And for yeah, and I mean, I, his biggest hypocritical line is that it's a complicated world, and it's. I, I think what she was looking for him was just to admit, yeah, unfortunately, that's just. That's just the way it is, and I'm not saying it's right, but mm -hmm. that's that's the way I act, and that's the way other cops act. You know, she was just essentially looking for validation of her viewpoint of the world. Yeah. Rather than this defensive. And also validation just from law enforcement as well. He he's in that position, uh, but what it, it's handled differently from two different races. Mm -hmm. Um. I certainly agree. Um, so let's talk about April, um, who who plays the lawyer and really kind of gets star some momentum in this, um, because the way she the the whole notion is that Khalil Khalil needs somebody to speak up for him, and for better or worse, that's that's you, meaning star. Mm -hmm. And so in this sense, April's the one. To kind of help guide her, and I thought I thought this was a strong performance, and I thought overall handled well. Where the concerns of her identity, they you know they did what they could. Obviously, there's going to be people who know that it's April, but if it's a national or sorry, star, but as long as it goes out nationwide, at least those people don't necessarily know. Right, and I liked April. Issa Rae is fantastic, and she's really. Uh, come up in the last few years. Uh, I, I think the the character of April. It's like I loved how she did push Star in a good way. It's like I know it's uncomfortable. Get out of your your circle of comfort here, but you do have to speak up for Khalil because if you don't, no one else is going to, and you're in the position to do that. So it wasn't like pressure it was good pressure not like hitting her over the head and forcing her to do it but at least justifying why it's important to speak up mm -hmm. and um and, and coming from the lawyer and I, I liked how they did establish her character like she did x y and z she, she's already credible so you know that she's on you know that side in that perspective so uh, i liked her and i i wanted to see more of her yeah there could be a spin-off there perhaps but it's when she did, when Star gets pushed to do this interview and kind of her when she makes that decision that she is going to be the voice for Khalil. What I appreciate is that she didn't. What everyone was always trying to do around her was to only tell a portion of the story. She was going to lay out everything. You guys think Khalil was a drug dealer? Guess what he was. But it's because of X, Y, and Z. And so she's not just holding the cops accountable but she's also trying to elevate her community to a higher standard of listen as much as we're being destroyed by outside forces we're also destroying ourselves equally um and that's where like any storyline that the biggest storyline that i don't know uh where i had no clue how this was going to play out it was the king storyline and specifically the drugs because i was like okay I, I see it but how do you handle this how do you solve this and um, cause he's, he's that force within, you know, there's evil all around you essentially. Yeah. And I, I think King was an interesting character because you saw, I was like, eh, first of all, Anthony Mackie is fantastic. Um, you saw such a scary figure that has such a powerful influence on that community. Everyone is afraid of him and no one wants to touch him or go near him. And yet he's in the position to really kind of threaten um, Star and that entire family. He, he has a very intimidating type of personality. And I think they did a great job with that because that is, he, he is the drug lord of that community. Don't mess with them. And he definitely showed that this is like snitches get stitches. That's what, you know, that was the whole message. Yeah, well, and, and the fact that that went away, you know, when you say you want to look out, like I think the the point of the message was when you say you got to want to look out for your community, you can't just overlook certain aspects of your community. Right. You know, it's not just us versus them. It's we have to uphold ourselves to a higher standard. And having drugs be sold in our neighborhood is not a high standard. Um, it's affecting lives and... And, he, you know, that that's where the connection, like, with Maverick really came in, and he was able to uh, really have a deeper 
moment with all of his kids, really, when he says, yeah, I, I, I thought, like Khalil, that by doing this, I could get out and this would make me money. You know, the American dream, essentially, but it's it's just another lie that they feed you. And if we're going to if we're going to rise up in any sort of way, we have to prevent that mm-hmm. from happening. And I like Maverick in that sense, because he has a person who, who who's done that, the bad deed, learn from it and realize that's not the way to go. There's a better life. It might be more difficult to lead the cleaner life, um, but it is possible. And, and I liked how he, he honed in on the message that, yeah, you can easily get into drugs. Anyone could. Mm-hmm. That's not the way to go. That's not your default position career. Yeah. No, it is not. Um, and so let's, in that sense, I, I want to kind of take a moment and really dissect the crisis moment of the movie, which is when the, we're in a complete standoff. Everyone's pretty much there. And of all people to to sort of, you know, be affected by this, right? Um, this whole idea of thug life, the hate you give little infants fucks everyone. Mm-hmm. It, it was very much a foreshadow, but I didn't know how it would be fully realized in that moment. Like, oh. All right. Because the little boy, he's handing the gun. Sikani. Which means joy. Mm-hmm. And I thought, would this be a ironic version of it where his name's joy but he's about to bring destruction to everything Mm -hmm. um this was this was in this moment i didn't know how to act i thought this was the biggest moment of tension because if if he pulled that trigger then everything's gone to shit um but obviously he was affected and, and 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 in that moment star seeing this and seeing how it has affected her brother and the decision she makes, no, I'm going to stand in front of him. So if he's going to shoot anybody, it's going to be me. Um, I don't think it gets more. Pat- I'm lost for words. Yeah, by far, this is the heaviest moment in the entire, the entire film. And in retrospect, we should have seen it coming with all the foreshadowing of the hate you give to infants. Um, I thought it was very well done because it, the whole lead up to it, you. They, they don't really focus on Sakani and how he views everybody. He's just kind of there, kind of tanging along, honestly. And, and it gets to a point of all this accumulated hate towards everybody affects the children and how he saw it. And the moment where Mav's trying to grab the gun and you don't see it in his back jeans, you know, you're like, where, oh, crap, where did the gun go? And it's the fact that it's in a child's hand is also scary for like a whole nother gun control issues. That's a whole nother issue. Um, but the that all this hatred towards each other and racial um, towards each other is just, it leads, it, it affects the youngest generation. It's like, this is what we're teaching our kids. Then had he pulled the trigger, his whole life in essence would be ruined. Not, he would be scarred mentally. Uh, and obviously like... I, I don't know all the laws, but I can't imagine he's like just being sent off to juvie yeah, no. for murder. It's like if if he went gang style and murdered half the people there, <coughs> you're doing some time. His life is done. Yeah. Um, and he's what seven? He's damn. young. He's young. Barely. Yeah. Um, I mean, in a sense, I don't want to spoil like American History X, but one of one of the themes of that movie is that things are very cyclical. All oh, right. With and, the brother, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm glad in this sense, I'm I'm extremely glad that someone showed a viewpoint that the cycle can be broken. And it's not like, quote unquote, we're fucked. And that's the point of the movie. I was like, oh, thank God. Thank God. Right. There's a happy ending. Um, and I like that because it also does just give the, the message to the adults. Like, this is what you're teaching the younger generation. This is what they're growing up with. Stop mm-hmm. it now before it gets worse. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so one of the things we haven't fully talked about is Chris. I know we talked to him tangentially, but I, I really want to talk about him because, um, you know, he, he too knows uh, a star version two. Um, and as the movie goes on, he starts to to understand and, and know her truly. Um, and yet 
he's got his own arc that he's got to go through and essentially realizing that what you think you know you don't actually know and so at the end of the day just just accept that you don't know because right. he tries to be cute or cute would be the word i use where he says like i don't see color and she says to him if you don't see color then you don't see who i really am and it's not to say that that's the only thing that defines you her but it's it's there right and i think it's interesting to have that um the younger teenage white male well, white privileged male um perspective too because i i liked at, at first his establishment just seemed like the naive boyfriend who only likes her you know because of girlfriend boyfriend situation but as the movie progresses you can see he actually does generally care about star and her well-being and if she's going through issues you need to talk about it with your your boyfriend or something so he was supportive in that sense not just from uh, you know, being the, the clingy boyfriend, but the actual loving boyfriend. And um, I appreciated that because, not to sound terrible, young white guys of this current demographic, majority of women are not like that. So it's very refreshing to see that. Yeah, and I, I, th I think he realized those certain things, and I'm, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad they portrayed an arc to him. You know, the only the only nitpick I have, if anything, is, um, you know, she, she makes a decision to stay with the rally and be involved. And he says, what do I do? And, and she, you know, granted, he's taking care of her friends and, and leading them away. But I'm like, no, if you're staying, I'm staying. Mm -hmm. That was my but I think I think, he, you know, did what he needed to do. And I don't think it shows cowardice in any. No, I don't think so. And I think it was actually good that he got out of that because the best, the only thing he really could do in that situation was to help the family. Because mm -hmm. obviously, Star has to be a part of it, but get the, again, get the kids out. Mm -hmm. Get the kids out of the violence and the trouble. Absolutely. All right, let's, we've been talking a lot about this duality, certainly from the perspective of Star. One of the things I appreciated. <clears throat> Uh, visually, her school, uh, the her school was very blue, and then her family life and and her neighborhood had a warmth to it. Yeah, yellow and orange, browns. Um, and that was obviously very deliberate to showcase that in that sense. Um, almost feels like the Matrix. They have the real world of the Matrix, where you have blue, <laughs> green and blue right. as the separating colors. Um, and also, like, they shot in Atlanta. Atlanta's a very popular place to shoot, but, but it's popular because you can have multiple, um, essentially distinct locations. To, uh, I don't know, I'm searching for the word, but flavors, let's say. <laughs> right. I think it's interesting how they portrayed the white community because you're talking about not being biased, but visually this movie is very biased. They, they made the white community and the school and just that environment so lifeless blue and saturated and white yes it's bright but it's not happy um it's not the the world that you actually want to be in or be a part of and i loved how they made her her home life her home uh her home uh very homely in that sense and very welcoming mm -hmm. and, and warm that there is love there it's not an ideal town but there's love and affection um, and connection to to just humanity in itself compared to the lifeless Caucasian community. And I think it's interesting how they showed that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think they were very aware of, obviously, what they wanted to do with the movie and show with the movie. Um, I mean, right from the get-go, this this was a, based on a book that hadn't yet been published but was already getting bidding awards to, to basically be adapted. Right. Um, and the book... A very renowned book at this point. It just came out in 2017, but um, so before they started making the movie, but uh, really well received and re just as from what I haven't read it directly, but just as powerful as the movie. In all essence, um, you know, one one of the things like we kind of glanced over it a little bit, but like as far as the talk, um, the real Maverick, the actor Russell, um, he was brought to tears you know, that as the opening moment, but he's like, I, I realize I have to have this talk with my kids. Right. And I think it's interesting because we've seen it. This isn't 
the first time we've seen quote unquote the talk within the black community like Grey's Anatomy had an episode like that it was multiple different shows and movies have shown this but it is the the action that you go off of because it already sets up that we know that Star was properly educated in what you do in a certain situation when you're against law enforcement and having that proper knowledge now seeing Khalil doing the exact opposite of what she was taught and what the audience knows what to expect it's frustrating because you not to say Khalil had it coming but you know it was building up to a moment that it's not going to end pretty and and in that sense when going back to the idea of of the foundation um Khalil didn't have the best foundation in his life like he had his grandmother and she cared but you know he needed to he, he need to be caretaker to her um so she could only do so much and impart whatever lessons she could on him but um he, need, he needed more and that wasn't necessarily there for him all right and i think this movie really does show the importance of parental influence because really the only parents you see are lisa and maverick and the and seven's biological mother and like that that family those are really the only parents and you can see the what they taught to their younger generation of young adults to compare to the other like Khalil and and Haley that their parental influence or just elder influence didn't have anything on them they weren't properly educated yeah i i always kind of equate it in this way um you know just like matter can neither be destroyed nor created you can apply that to all aspects of life and so in this sense just because Khalil didn't have parental figures well there's a, something else has got to take that void right and unfortunately that becomes king and that's what he gravitated towards and and so in that sense like if if you're going to replace the drugs in your community you have to replace it with something you don't you can't just eliminate it and not replace it um and i think that's something that uh people should also be aware of you know and that's why you know there, there's after school programs that's a big thing like the people mm -hmm. rather than move that move any sort of kids towards something they try to move them towards something positive you know away from something towards something yes exactly um anyway uh one of the hopes from from the director uh george tillman jr i thought he did a fantastic job but his hope is that uh this would you know spark a lot of conversation and what's interesting to note about him is that um, you know he's he's very well I would say n knowledgeable of these issues like it's a passion of his let's say that's probably not the right word but right. <laughs> uh, interested maybe you know somewhere along this basically he's well educated and well versed and and it has meaning for him and he wants to tell the story right right and then another film of George Tillman which I loved uh, was Men of Honor that he was a part of and it. That is another movie that deals with uh, an African American black uh, black man in a predominantly white um, society and overcoming the the racial slurs and, and odds in that sense to become and earn his place within a certain community and get the respect from people. And so this type of topic is not new to George Tillman, and he has a great way of showing the both sides of how people look at one certain moment yeah and, and what's great um i'm not all too familiar with full his work but but even just evidenced by this movie he doesn't pick a side he creates a new perspective mm -hmm. um you know obviously it's in the text of the script and all that but nonetheless he is able to bring to life that sentiment in the most beautiful ways um Let's talk about music because we opened up with a Tupac song, uh, and you know Tupac is very much prevalent throughout the movie, uh, and musically they needed to kind of keep that theme going, right? And um, for the most part, they were able to do it. Um, you know, Dustin O'Halloran mm -hmm. <laughs> is the composer of this, and he was very much um, he he wanted to have that sort of style and. As he says, uh, hip hop is poetry. It's raw, it's unfiltered, and very reflective of black culture. Star's going through some 
something so traumatic, but we're not holding back. We show the ups and downs. That's what hip hop does. They go hand in hand. Right, and there was a lot of obviously uh, Tupac Shakur music and theme embedded throughout, and we even saw a poster of Tupac. Just the influence of of how and what Tupac is is known for is putting politics into his music, but understanding like this is how people look at certain things, and and I think that that definitely reflects with the the theme of what this movie is: is how do you look. From your perspective at a certain situation and i think that's good they did um just that community uh like it, they did a great favor to them absolutely um box office wise it opened up very limited um but then went wider last week um opening weekend overall it made 7.5 million over that weekend so um it's slowly making back its budget and I, I i wish it opened up even more uh, and and whatnot but the fact that it has a 97 percent on rotten tomatoes and an a plus cinema score um i think super high super high and this will have legs as things kind of continue right and the good thing about this movie is it is timeless in a way it's not set in a certain time of the year um but the the themes are universal that uh it's still relevant 60 years ago today and Lincoln's still relevant today. So I think it's, it's something that still needs to be talked about. I I couldn't agree more. Hopefully, you know, fingers crossed that conversations like this won't need to be had mm -hmm. in the next few years. But unfortunately, I don't, I don't fully foresee that happening. Um, but that is the hope. And um, a movie like this at least illustrates a, a, a positive hope and that things can change. And that's what I love. And in fact, I do encourage you, for those of you watching and, or listening, please let us know your comments. Um, after all, a, a movie like this begs conversation. And so to not continue the conversation Marissa and I started, I think, um, would be a disservice to this movie. Right. So I think my one question to you is to, to round it up, because we are at the beginning now of the 2018-2019 Oscar race. Do you feel this movie has chances to be in that race? I believe so. Uh, and it could be for a number of things. Best adaptation. Uh, it could be for acting. I wouldn't be surprised at direction. Um, you know, I think I think George does such a wonderful job. It's It, it just feels very matter of fact. Um, and like, this is life. Um, they've in essence removed like the artifice of storytelling and just mm -hmm. kept it you know for what it is obviously yes it is told from the perspective of star because she's got the narration but uh it doesn't beat you over the head with it um so i think there's a number of things that this could be nominated for and a number of things i would want it to be nominated for i would like uh, it could be nominated for adaptation but i think russell hornsby definitely put on an Academy Award performance for probably best supporting actor for Maverick because every time we saw him, he was always imparting some wisdom um, or something new and you can relate to him. And I loved him as a strong foundational parental figure to look for. He, I felt personally watching him, he's the foundation of the movie. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I think personally he was the best part. Fair enough. I, I I wouldn't disagree, um, except for the fact that I also think like everyone else really did well. Um, Regina Hall again, Common, uh, Anthony Mackie, like he was a deplorable character, but <laughs> played him well. Played deplorable very well. So um, so kudos to them all around. Yeah, I, I'm really hoping that, that, that they get some love when the time comes around. Um, so, but uh, we'll see. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, we are doing Colette uh, a little bit later today, so feel free to check that out. Also, we've been doing a lot of movies in the past. Um, a lot of early contenders, A Star is Born, we've covered that. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, thematically, uh, Black Klansmen, uh, Sorry to Bother You, they're sort of on par with a certain dialogue like this so i encourage you to check those anatomies out moving forward we're going to be doing bad times at the el royale next week we've sort of been behind on that it's uh 
quick spoiler f- from my perspective. I really loved it. <laughs> so go check that movie out if you haven't seen it. Um, unfortunately, it's not getting the love that, it, for me, it deserves. So I'm looking forward to talking about it with Marissa and the gang. Uh, and, and then we'll have some other movies as well. Beautiful Boy. Uh, so Nutcracker's coming out in a few weeks. So we'll be talking about that. Lots to look forward to. Yeah, we have the Christmas movies and then the Oscar race movies. So Yeah. We're we're there. <laughs> we're there. Fall is upon us. Um, at Serafini TV for Marissa. Yep. At D Movie Seventeen O One is where you can interact with Dimitri Panos, who was not here, but uh, but normally part of our show. I'm at Phil Sweetnack. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Popcorn Talk Network. From producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network.